Welcome to The Driven Entrepreneur, where we sit down with visionaries, trailblazers, and entrepreneurs and discover why and how they do what they do. We'll get the backstory, plus plenty of life and business lessons along the way. Here's your host, Matt Browning. Hey, this episode is brought to you by my very own NLP practitioner course. I've been teaching neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP, for nearly 15 years. It is the most powerful tool for communication on the planet, and it can be yours today. For a very limited time, I'm giving away my entire NLP course workbook for free. Go to nlpwithmatt.com. All the patterns, all the tools, and the techniques of NLP in the complete course workbook, the same one that we use to teach our live certification classes, yours free. NLPwithmatt.com. Get it today. Let's get back to the show. Hey, what's going on, my friends? Welcome back to The Driven Entrepreneur. It's Matt Browning, and it's another beautiful day. It really is. I'm looking out, and I am just excited to get out and, and enjoy the day uh, because I have the freedom to do that because I'm a business owner. You're a business owner. You're about to be a business owner. You're striving to be a business owner. That's why you listen to this. And one of the things that I have actually struggled with a lot in my career, and I've been you know, still self-employed since I was 20, 21 years old. So coming up on 20 years. And, you know, I've started a fair amount of businesses. I've grown a fair amount of businesses. I've made a lot of money. I made a bit of impact. The problem I've always faced for myself is the maturity side of business. Do you know what I mean? Like getting to the point where you break beyond the first five, 10 employees beyond the seven figure mark, and really something sustainable that can go towards growth in a big, big way. And even eventually sailing, uh, automating, putting the CEO in place and that kind of thing. So today, I, I want to talk about the mature side of business and how you wherever you are can move in that direction, even from day one. My guest this week is uh, someone I'm so excited to sit down with Terry Lammers. Now, Terry grew up watching his parents run a fuel and lubricants company in, in the industry. And back in the early 90s, he became a full-time employee, which is pretty fun when you see a family-run business that way. Then he took over as president of the company. And in an 18-year span, Terry took the business uh, to purchasing 11 different companies. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And he grew the family business from 750000 in sales to over $40 million. Yeah, that's right. Four zero million dollars when the company was sold back in 2010. Um, he's also now a co-founder and a managing member of Innovative Business Advisors, where he's helping people tap into financial expertise, a lot of hands-on business experience, and really how to guide business owners that are interested in buying, as well as current business owners, how to sell their enterprises. So I'm excited to get into that in a really in-depth uh, experience. His new book is out, uh, You Don't Know What You Don't Know, <laughs> Understanding and Looking at the In-Depth Process of Buying, Growing, and Eventually Selling Businesses. Terry, how are you doing, my friend? I am fantastic. Great to be on. Thanks, Matt. Buddy, I am, uh, I've am. i been looking forward to this for a while. We were going to have this, I think, a few months back, and today's the day, so I want to jump right in with you. Um, I find it really interesting. When I hear stories about people who have grown up in a family business, now, my dad had a family business, but I never got involved in it. He was refining silver. Some of the people have heard that story. When you were growing up younger, well, first off, when did the family business start? How old were you? Was it always going on? Or do you remember when dad or mom and dad jumped into this thing? What was that like as kind of as the business side as a kid and family? Yeah, so the company was actually founded in like 1920. And it's amazing. I have the first um, uh financial statements from the company but my dad uh went to vietnam and he came out and you know had a job needed a job and and he, he started working for the company and he eventually bought it like around 1975 so you know uh so i've been around the company my whole life i started driving gas trucks when i was 13 years old and and was literally riding in the truck when my dad when i was you know and, you know, from the time that I could remember. So I truly grew up in the company. Um, you know, it was never, you know, it was never nothing elite, just always that, that, um, 
middle of the road family, you know, and, and it was kind of crazy when I came back in 1991, I jokingly tell people it was me, my mom and dad, we had two trucks and it was a good day if they both started. So trust me, I've seen the struggles and, and my starting salary was zero. My dad made my car payment and I took my spending money out of the petty cash. And how old are you in 1991 when you come back and say, hey, I'm officially going to work in this family business? 21. 21 years old. Okay. So it's kind of crazy. Like, yeah, I was laughing when you said you've been uh, self-employed since you was 20 or 21. It's like I bought my first business and took the company over when I was 21. Because of the banking situation that my dad was in, uh, I started a new company called Tri-County Petroleum. And we, we merged my dad's company in with my company. And, you know, we, we took off from there. We had the opportunity to buy another company. Um, Wait, look, can, I, can I back up just for a second? Because I think yeah. that's really interesting. Um, there's more than one way to do this. So first off, in the beginning, you said that this company has been around for 55 years, roughly. Mm -hmm. And your dad had the opportunity to buy in. Was he an employee of the company? He was an employee and he eventually bought it. And he eventually bought it. Okay. And then you come in and it didn't make sense to grow as is because of what a financial structure. And I don't need all the details for it, but anything you want to share about why would you not grow it? Why instead are you say, Hey, I'm going to start my own fresh gas company and then purchase or merge or just bring this one on. It's a very interesting story. Um, have you heard, it does, does everybody in your audience should know what a UCC filing is. Tell us what that is. Universal commercial code. So when you, when you borrow money from a bank, you are very likely going to sign, or it's going to be included in the documents in that fine detail that you don't even know, a UCC filing. That means the bank has a lien on your assets, and that's out there. So we was in a situation where, back, if you remember back in the early 90s, interest rates were high. And, and that's when all of the, um, your, your, remember the old two bay gas stations and full service and self service, and it was all going to convenience stores and stuff like that. So, um, the banks were not wanting to work with oil companies. So that's another thing for your listeners to really think about. Think of the industry that you're in, whether you're in real estate construction or whatever, do you have a bank that wants to work with you? Well, back in the early nineties, Working with an oil company was not, you know, was not on their list of preferred customers. So this bank didn't want to work with my dad. So uh, because the interest rates were really high, this is another great point for people to think about. He was making like double, triple payments on all of his loans, but he never saved any cash. So then all of a sudden he was the one with a, that two bay gas station with a leaking underground storage tank. And, and the banker told him that he could rebuild it. So he shut it down to rebuild it. And the, honestly, God, this true story. The banker committed suicide. Oh my gosh. Yes. So farming was bad in those days. And, and he literally went home at noon and committed suicide and the new person that came into the bank said, no, we're not going to lend you the money because your sales are down. Well, yeah, the sales are down because he closed, you know, he closed a third of his business. So we had the opportunity to buy another company. <clears throat> and I knew from my, I had the financial background and I knew if we bought this company, you know, we would be back in the black, so to speak. So, but because of that, back to that UCC filing, if my dad, the guy was willing to sell the company contract for deed or an earnout situation. But if my dad bought it, the bank has a blanket UCC loan or yes. UCC filing on the company. So whatever he acquires, they automatically have their hands on. So those assets become encumbered as well, current yeah. and future, which is yeah. a huge thing. Guys, you need to know that too. Like even today, if yeah. you're looking at the SBA, a lot of SBA loans, depending on the size, they're going to be cross collateralized or you're talking about the UCC filing. So it's not just your property, it's also the, the business and it's real property and it's, it's a lot more. So, and we don't run into that a lot in the small business side of things, but depending on what the industry is for sure. Well, you do, but people don't really realize right. th that, they, that they signed that agreement. So those are the sneaky things when you go up to sell something and the, the bank or somebody comes back and says, hey, there's this lien on your property. And you're like, what? Yeah, that's that UCC filing. So, so I started the company, I started a, a new company 
And uh, we was available, we was able to avoid that. And that kind of forced the bank's hand to, you know, renegotiate the notes because, you know, he had paid down that debt, but if, if they refinance it, it would be, we would be just fine. So that kind of forced her hand to do that. I don't know, that's kind of a long story, but that's why we started a new company. Merged. Hey man, that's really good. So now you're coming in going, Hey bank, uh, you know, here's a new company. We're going to acquire this other one and you have a deed on it. Do you want to get your money back? Are you willing to refinance and work that? That's pretty cool. So you get started, um, really running the same kind of business and your sales are in that range of 750. And I'm getting the impression that is it just one gas station or are you doing no. other products at so that yeah. point? So back we had two and 4,000 gallon trucks that we delivered fuel to people. So our ah. customers were, I mean, my dad had a gas station back in the day, but as it grew, we delivered fuel to farmers, excavators, construction companies, manufacturing, stuff like that. So, you know, it wasn't a gas station where you come and get, you know, fill your car up. We delivered fuel in 500, 2,500 gallon tanks. So. Right, so so when you look at a business like that, and again, I'm assuming most, most of you listening aren't running fuel distribution companies. So what we want to talk about, of course, and some of you might be, and you're like, yes, this is my episode. <laughs> but what we want to talk about, Terry, is kind of the principles behind that that are going to be universal for different companies. So when you're running, you're running a distribution company. Um, when you look at wanting to grow, was there a certain moment when you see what you're doing and I think I've seen myself in this issue where I'm busy, I want to grow, but I'm busy just kind of putting out fires. You know, if I have a muffin shop, it's like I want to open up a new shop, but I got customers in line, my person's sick, I'm just trying to get muffins in the customer's hands. Did you have a point where you you had to make a definitive decision to change from just servicing what you're doing to really taking a chunk of time out to grow? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Because, you know, when it started out, I was driving the gas truck. Me and my dad were both driving a gas truck. And then we purchased this company and it was still just the two of us. And then we purchased another company and there was three of us. And then you get to the point where I'm not driving the gas truck. I'm managing the other drivers and kind of being a dispatcher. And then you get to a point where you, we bought a couple more companies and now I have a dispatcher. Right. And at the end, at the end, I had three operations managers, a, you know, a, a, an office manager, and I didn't really have anything to do with the ongoing daily operations of the business. I was out looking to buy other businesses and consequently got bought, you know, but, but to get from the point where you're the doer to where you know, you're truly on top of your business and the leader, man, that is a long, difficult process. Oh, I was hoping you had like a quick tip that we could just become that. No. Well, well <laughs> I think that, <laughs> yeah, years of experience, but the quick tip is you, you have got to get to the point where you realize that you're going to be a leader and not a doer and that you, you there, I mean, because you're, you know, as your company goes up, you're going to hit a plateau for a little bit where you have to take yourself out of the company to be the leader and hire somebody to do what you was doing. So it's going to affect the income of the company. But, you know, for me, I, I am a big fan of growing by acquisition. And for anybody out there right now with the baby boomers retiring, oh my God. I mean, it couldn't be a more perfect time to, to look at acquiring other companies. Well, and let's talk about that a little bit, because I think in some industries, I can see it really plainly, like maybe in financial services, you go, hey, you have a book of business or insurance companies, right? You have a book of business, I could buy your company and acquire your clients and contracts. How does it work in other industries? Um, I don't know, is it about getting the database? Is it about, you know, I know like Amazon looked at Whole Foods, at looking at their distribution process. And I know you probably have a, a um, you could weigh in on that for sure from a distribution standpoint, but what were you looking at? What do you quote acquiring when you acquire another business? Why is that allowing you to grow? Is it the customer base? Is it the trucks they have? What is it? It's several things. I mean, it's the customer base. Maybe you're in a new geographical territory, but also think about, so for me, you know, we sold fuel and lubricants. As we got bigger, when I would acquire a company, we also had bulk oil sales. So maybe I'm gonna acquire a company that doesn't sell bulk oil. So now when I buy that company, I can sell bulk oil to their customers 
So I'm selling more of my products to their customers into what they could previously sell. But it also gets flipped around is what if you acquire a company that's selling something that you don't sell currently sell to your customers. So now by acquiring them, you open up a market for all of your current customer base. So gotcha. So you're doing some cross uh, platform, cross product acquisition absolutely. as well in a way. Can yeah. you give me an example of that in your industry? So you acquire a company and they're, I don't know, maybe, are they doing like oil testing or something? And you're like, we didn't do that before, but now we own the plant or they have the facilities and we can offer that to everyone else. And yeah, and so one of the companies that I bought, and it's actually the first page and the first, first page of my book. Um, so we was a fuel company that sold lubricants. I bought a lubricants company that also sold fuel. So I was a company that sold fuel, mainly sold fuel and also sold lubricants. My, my lubricants facility was literally an old barn that I raised calves in when I was a kid. And we was busting at the seams. So when I bought the lubricants company that also sold fuel, they had, I don't know how many thousand square feet it was, but a 50,000 storage facility for bulk oil. I mean, <laughs> it for incredible. what incredible. Yeah. So when I paid for the company, I couldn't have built that facility for new. And oh, by the way, I got 300,000 gallons worth of sales from, from buying it. So I was able to expand geographically in, in, in my facilities all by just acquiring a company versus trying to sell it new. Outstanding. I mean, so, so we really need to think about that. And look, when you're acquiring a business, could you quickly, um, and I'm sure you outlined some of this in your book too. Remember the book is You Don't Know What You Don't Know. Um, what a great business book. It's available on Amazon. And uh, just a quick plug, if you go to you don't know what you don't know dot com. Um, Terry, what I love about how you wrote your book is it's, it's a really a big how to, and it's a big application book, right? So it's not just one of these books you read and you go, oh, I'm trying to remember it. But at, at the end of every chapter, you have questionnaires and you have kind of the, the application of what do I need to do now? Um, it's exciting. And so what I was getting to is um, financing for acquiring. I think some people are thinking, I don't have the extra cash flow or the money right now stocked away in my sock drawer to buy a, another business. Can you talk to about some of the creative ways that you acquire businesses? I'm sure they weren't all just, here's a pile of mattress money. <laughs> I'm assuming. I don't know. I might be wrong. Yes. And, and it's so funny because you're right. There, I mean, I think I could write a book. You don't know what you don't know. 101 ways to buy a business. Because I would I've love that. It. Can we do that part two? <laughs> yes, because I've done it every way imaginable. So you're exactly right. The very first company I bought, we didn't have the money. I mean, I mean we didn't have, we, my dad wasn't a bankable person. I'm 21 years old. I'm certainly not that bankable of a person. So what I mean by bankable is can I go to the bank to borrow this money to buy this company? The answer was a flat no. So how, it, it, here's exactly how I bought my first company. We literally gave the guy $10,000 in cash. After we met and signed the papers, I pulled $10,000 worth of cash out of the glove compartment and gave it to him. And he financed the sale of the business for five years. And it worked out perfect. You know, as we went along, there was situations where um, the owner financed some of the business and we paid him cash for some of the business. I had two situations where uh, they was distressed businesses. I mean, one, the fastest company I ever bought was in three days. Found out about it on a Wednesday, called the guy, said, what's going on? He said, I'm closing the doors on Friday. I said, what are you doing with your customers? He said, I'm sending them somewhere else. So I said, hold the phone. I'll be right there. And wow. in a half an hour, I was there and talking to him and worked out a deal where I paid him 25% of the gross profit for the customers that are referred over to me for one year. And then I had the opportunity to do that with another company that geographically was way far away. The owner was going to stay and work for me, but he was going out of business. And, but, but if he left, I didn't know where, I mean, this is out, we're in a very rural area. Everybody's out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know where they're at. So it was a very amicable to make, way to make it work. Did I have situations where we just wrote the check and bought the company? Absolutely. But if you're that person out there that's saying like, I ain't got the money to do this. There's, a, a multitude of ways to acquire a company. I, I had a conversation with a company yesterday that they're in kind of a precarious situation where they're a commodity business and there's a lot of big players that are forcing them out. 
So to get top dollar. So if you're a seller, think about this. If you're a seller, a lot of times if you're willing to do some owner financing, it will allow you to get a higher dollar for your company yes. versus just getting the check. So you really have to think it from both sides of the fence, to be honest with you. You know, and are you willing to be in, I mean, we had a very good way of acquiring companies and that we, you know, because the customers that we were buying, no contracts with, so they could go anywhere they wanted to go. But we always kept the previous owner around and, and went around and met with those customers. So, you know, the old 80, 20 rule, you know, or 20% of your bit, 20% of your customers get you 80% of your income. Yes. So, you know, we would go see those 20% of the customers right out of the gate. And the previous owner, we, we always paid them a fair price for the company. So they walked away feeling like they was treated fair. And when they would tell the customer, you know, that they had a relationship with that, it's like, hey, Terry paid me a fair price for my business. He's a good guy. Give him a shot. We would keep 95% of the customers every time. And wow, really 95%. Out. That's incredible. And, and, yeah. and you're saying that's a huge testament to... Um, not just how you do business, but how you did business with the acquired company. How did you yeah. treat them in the contract? And that just, the, the rewards come because of that. No, don't get crazy. So here's another thing that I think is really important for um, your listeners to think about. Think, uh, um, and this gets down to the valuation of company. What do you pay for a company? So in the book I talk about, this is where me and my accountant always butted heads because I knew if it's like, if I buy this company, I'm going to get into a new geographical territory and I can cross sell these customers and they're going to be really valuable to me. But there's a, there's two types of valuations that I'll tell you. So I'm a CVA, a certified valuation analyst. That's a national designation to value companies. What me and my accountant would butt heads about is he would always say, Terry, you pay for a company for the cash flow that it's spinning off. Okay. And when I do a business valuation on a company right now, I'm sure I always tell them that. It's like, look, I'm valuing the cash flow that you're making right now. Okay, but now think of it from a strategic standpoint. You know, say you're an HVAC company and you're going to buy another HVAC company. Well, you're going to eliminate a lot of the operating expenses that that selling HVAC company has. So sure. if you eliminate 40%, if, if you know if, if you're valuing the company off the current cash off its current cash flow, but if you buy it, you know your insurance is going to be much lower. You don't have to have the CPA or his accountant, so that's going to go away. I mean, you can easily a lot of times eliminate forty to fifty percent of the operating expenses, and if you change that cash flow, the strategic value yes. of that company is much higher than the financial value of that company, and that's where growing by acquisition can really be just a super way to grow the company. So if you're really good at structuring your own business and your own policies and procedures, you know, you have a great ops manager, you have a great COO in place, or you are that person, you can look like you said, in the HVAC uh, industry, you can look at another office and go, I don't need a, a second office manager. We don't need two offices for sales. We can have all the sales route through one office and then expenses cut. So you're not so much, I love that. So when you first started saying that, I was thinking about like potential value, meaning I'm a strategic guy. So I think, how could I, <clears throat> excuse me, how could I raise sales? How could I go to a new market? But that's different. That's like potential growth. What you're talking about a strategic valuation, which is on day one or day 90 or whatever it is, how can I instantly change the net profits for the business and you know what it's worth? Will you still go in and offer them prices according to where they are now? Or do you kind of take that strategic value into consideration and give them sometimes a quote uh, over asking price to be extra fair and oh. sure they're really excited, but you know you're still getting a sweet deal? Can you kind of talk about how do you come in on pricing? Man, you're touching my buttons. Oh, ooh, I Who's like touching the buttons, up? buddy. No, Break this, it. This, this <laughs> what chapter is that in? <laughs> so I talk about a story in the book where I had two offices. Well, I had, at the end of the day, I had four offices and five bulk plans, but at the time I had two offices 30 miles apart. And there's a little town in between us with a guy that ran an oil company. He was a one person operator. I call it a one horse show, but he had a bulk plant. That is a bulk storage facility. 
in my opinion, from a financial valuation, he wanted about a hundred thousand dollars more than what the company was worth. Right. But the last thing I wanted in the world was a competitor to come in and buy that bulk plant and be able to expand that territory and, and, and you know, and be a threat to the high customer concentration rate that I had. So I talk about, it's like, so did I pay him a hundred thousand dollars more than what the company was worth financially? And the answer is heck yes. And I tore down his bulk plant and nobody was ever going to build another one there. And we kept 95% of the customers. So then think about it. He was a one person operation. So from, again, to go back to our previous, from a financial perspective, it was a hundred thousand dollars too much from a strategic perspective. I mean, eliminated literally with this guy, 90% of his operating expenses. So literally his gross profit fell straight to my bottom line. So he got a hundred thousand dollars more than his company was probably worth, but was it worth for me to pay that? The, the answer is unequivocally yes, because I eliminated a competitor and I kept <laughs> another competitor from coming into the territory that might, you know, be more sophisticated and try and take customers away from me. And I'll tell you, you got me thinking that's for sure. Um, as we, as we kind of wind down here, I can't believe how quickly time goes in these shows. Um, I would love to just continue this for another couple hours <laughs> with you. Cause I, I'm excited, man. I want to start acquiring businesses. Goodness sakes. What, do you have advice for someone who, like I look at my, so I'm in more of a consulting, I'm in media, I'm in training, coaching. I do a lot of different areas of that in business. For me, I don't see my business industry as very acquirable, if that's a good word, mm -hmm. for the smaller sizes. Some of them, you know, if you, you know, there's some businesses that have done this that have a really large database, um, like a massive database, and that might be worth something. Do you have advice for someone who wants to maybe jump industries? You know, because I think on one side, I can get excited about the conversation and go, hey, maybe I should buy a laundromat. And then a guy like Terry might come out and say, what do you know about running laundromats? Don't touch it. Or, hey, you should go in and learn and you can do this. How do you kind of get, have you ever gotten from your industry to a slightly different industry? Or do you stay in your lane because that's the smartest strategy? Kind of, What's your take on that in general? After I sold the oil company, um, I bought with a partner a property management company. So okay, that's really, different. Yeah, 110% different. So right out of the gate, I knew how to buy oil companies. I know how to look at trucks. I know how to look at facilities. I understand it. I don't know nothing about a property management company. And we made a lot of due diligence errors. My partner owned a real estate company and he knew how to run a real estate company or property management because he did that also, but he never bought a company. So he didn't know what due diligence questions to ask. So what happened was we buy the company, the computers are shot, the phone system shot. Nobody's gotten a raise in the past five years. So they all got their hand out right out of the gate. And there was just a lot of things that we missed on the due diligence side of that acquisition. So when you talk about staying in your lane, that is something where you have to be very careful. If you're jumping into something that you've never done before, be aware, you know, especially if you're buying the company, you, you know, what, what are the due diligence questions and I need to be asking when I'm buying that company? Because, you know, we talked about the financial value of a company, but we also coach in our program, you know, what are the non-financial things that could really affect the value or sellability of the company? And those are the things that really can come back and bite you. Um, so you gotta be very careful of that. The other thing that I would tell you is if you do want to switch lanes or no matter what you do and, and, and in a way where I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, are you building a company that has recurring revenue? So think about, again, not to give a cheap plug to the book, but there's a chapter in the book about building value in the company and what makes it valuable. The recurring revenue of an aspect of a company will always get you more value and always be, you got to get it to where you're not it. You know, you have a management team behind you and that's a big deal. We have a company listed right now that should easily fetch $6 million, but the owner of the company is literally integrally involved in it. And we're having a problem selling it because without him, the company doesn't exist. Right. And, oh, makes perfect sense. Hey, Terry. So you, you, this book is, uh, is, 
pretty darn amazing here. Uh, again, it's what you, you, you don't know what you don't know. And you can find out more at you don't know what you don't know.com. Um, Terry, how can people follow you, find out a little more about you? And what do you want to tell them about the book? This is your time to plug, man. I, uh, I really, really, I, I can't encourage you enough to align yourself with Terry Lammers here and learn, get under his learning tree. It's not very often you find a guy like this that's been in, in multiple industries for as long as he has. So Terry, how do we find out more about you and what do you want us to know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm honored to tell you that the book was listed by Forbes magazine last year, the top 10 business book to read. So I should have started um, with that, man. I didn't, I didn't see that accolade. That's amazing. You're killing me. Smalls gone. <laughs> <laughs> Carry so, on. No, all the, I mean, all the regular social media stuff, you know, you can easily find me on LinkedIn. Um, the website for the book is you don't know what you don't know.com. Um, our website for innovative is innovative BA. And so the name of the company is innovative business advisors. Uh, our website's innovative BA.com. Well, yeah. You are an innovative BA, my friend. Yeah. So click on the media tab. There's tons of podcasts and speaking and articles I've written and stuff like that. My partner, Steve Denny, is amazing also. Um, it's really cool. I love our coaching program. Uh, we call it uh, Chief Everything Officer to Chief Executive Officer, so CEO to CEO. So we're really excited about that, and it's gotten national attention, which is pretty cool. So, you know, we're out there, you know, YouTube, you can search Innovative Business Advisors and, you know, tons of stuff out there from our weekly um webinars that we do but it's really fun i enjoy helping business owners i mean i went from literally a starting salary of zero to selling my company for well into the seven figures and and um I, I just love helping people with exit planning and and you know helping them get there i mean the conversation i had yesterday with four siblings about selling you know the company they just they're in they don't know what they don't know and they don't know what to ask and they don't know who to go to and they're just you know, they're in that angst of a moment and they're all in their sixties and they need to do something. So, um, it is something that it's just, it's, it's humbling. You know, you talk about church and family and God and on your website and stuff. And, and I'm a true believer in all that. And it, it almost makes me choke up because you just, you see people get in situations where, it's like, oh my God, they could have captured the world and done so much to help other people. But because they stuck their head in the sand, I call it the ostrich syndrome, you, you, you know, and they, they squandered the whole company and they really could have done some, some better things with it. And when you read the book, you don't know what you don't know. And you connect with Terry Lammers uh, at Innovative Business Advisors, you can finally figure out what you don't know. And just in this short conversation, my friend, I've learned a lot of things that I didn't know. Um, and I'm excited, man. I'm excited for the future. I'm excited to start looking at acquisitions, perhaps. I'm excited about uh, becoming a CEO, not just a CEO. Did y'all catch that? Go from chief everything officer to chief executive officer. And a lot of us, you know, startups and entrepreneurs call ourselves CEOs and we don't mean it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not really the CEO. I'm just the, I'm the laborer and I'm everything else. So Terry, uh, excited to, you're going to help us get out and get up and really grow to the next level. Terry, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, you're a legend. I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it very much. All right, guys, that's the show this week. Driven Entrepreneur, man. Uh, yeah, make sure you follow Terry Lammers. I, I can't, um, I, I just can't tell you enough uh, that you need someone like this in your life. You need, whether it's just from his books or from podcast interviews and blogs and articles and things he's writing. Uh, Forbes says he's one of the top business books to get. So I believe him. You got to go do that. And find out about whether it's acquiring, whether it's becoming a real CEO, whether it's uh, selling your business one day. Uh, he's the guy to help you do it. So make sure you follow that. And hey, follow the show. Uh, you can follow me at Matt Browning, B-R-A-U-N-I-N-G, Browning. I'm at Matt Browning on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. I'm not really on Twitter, but check out YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and um, follow the show. And make sure you subscribe, rate and review if you haven't already. I really mean it. Subscribe because this show comes out every Friday uh, on demand. So if you're listening to this in your car as you're driving down the road in, in uh, your amazing vehicle listening on the radio, make sure you head over to any on-demand platforms like Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get podcasts. And this show also, of course, 
shows up on demand. You can get it right to your phone. It's free. I get hundreds of back episodes. Everyone's available back to number one. So check it out, The Driven Entrepreneur on Demand. I'll see you next week. In the meantime, stay driven. All right. Bye-bye.